Hey everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Engineering Project Management Podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping project managers to sharpen their project management skills. I'm going to be your host today. Once again, my name is Matt Douglas, and in this episode of the Engineering Project Management Podcast, I'm going to be speaking with Mike Watry, who's the vice president and also the co-founder at Foresight Planning and Engineering Services. And we're going to be talking about the critical roles of effective scheduling, project controls, and integrating project data in ensuring the success of engineering engineering projects. Now with that, let's jump right into today's episode. It's now time for our PM conversation of the week with Michael Watry. So Michael, we just want to thank you for being on the podcast. Welcome to the Engineering Project Management Podcast. How are you doing today? Good, sir. Thanks for having me. Good, good. So Go ahead and jump right into this right now. So, Mike, could you tell us a little bit more about your career journey and what led you to specializing in engineering project management? Sure. So, uh, my career started up in Minnesota after I graduated from the University of Minnesota. Civil engineering degree, you know, just felt like I needed to walk that track and started my career uh, in design. But ultimately, left, there was always some element of, of my career leaving me with curiosity. If you're in a design shop, how do things get built? And okay, now how things get built, how do they get managed and paid for and things of that nature. And so, you know, my career transcended accordingly based on that curiosity from design to alternative delivery, to projects in state, to projects out of state, which led me to the state of Texas. And ultimately I credit, you know, the opportunities that my mentors gave me along the way. I think that they identified you know, some natural skill sets beyond maybe what was on the resume. It required a bit of courage to critically evaluate, you know, am I, you know, on this earth to be a a structural engineer or am I, you know, destined for other things and and how do I control that destiny? And so ultimately that's led to opportunities to give back, to be a mentor, to be a leader. And so that's why I'm excited to to be in the role that, that I am in now. And have the opportunity to give back, and I and I feel that that's a, an obligation to the industry, uh, and as a civil engineer, that's an obligation to society to to leave the civilization that that we create better than where we found it, and and that that comes with growing tomorrow's leaders in this industry today. Oh, that's awesome to to hear that. I'm I'm glad to, that you mentioned the whole giving back portion of that because that's actually one of the, like the first times that we really hear about that from an engineering professional. I think that sometimes a lot of engineering professionals are kind of just in their own mind, in their own world, doing their own projects and stuff. And we really don't understand the impact of what it is that we do, especially in the AEC industry. Like everything that's out here is impacted by what we are doing on a, you know, yeah. like on a, on a day-to-day basis, roads, you know, uh, drainage, drinking water, structures that we're living in, houses, you know, everything is unpack- impacted by us. So to be able to to be an effective mentor and leader and kind of like shaping the future, I think that that's a really important thing that a lot more of us need to take more pre, uh, part, more of a part in, um, in order to keep on growing the future. So let's yeah. start to get a little bit more into what it is that you're doing in your role. So could you, you know, how do, how does effective project scheduling contribute to better communication and stakeholder management? Sure. So the art and science of scheduling um, is really a a facilitative exercise. You know, you're talking about giving back. That is a a service provided to a project manager, a project team. Um, And so what effective project scheduling at its core does is it provides, you might say, a a literal roadmap in some ways in terms of of a network of activity and its interconnectedness of what has to happen in what order and which of those things is driving the overall project and facilitating that discussion and with an emphasis on the forecast of who needs to be in what place to get what result. I find schedules and their effectiveness to be measured based on their ability to establish, you know, what I might call a common vocabulary. You know, I, I think, um, you know, in my scheduling practice, I'll, I'll, certainly be able to delve into some of the technical aspects of, of float and, and, and some other technical terms. But the reality of it is that those aren't necessarily practical concerns as it lends itself to leading a group of people to do certain things, which is then 
the necessary translation of, okay, well, how do we put a schedule in place that uses words that we all understand and has objective measurability of those things to then relieve folks to not have, um, let's say, potential disagreements or stressful situations to resolve problems. It's a, There's a disconnectedness from how someone might feel about it versus an establishment of a tool that is an entity of the project, right? So we're looking at the project's challenges, the project's forecast. And as a result, that gives us a little bit, you know, if you and I had a had a concern and we had a difference of opinion on how we might solve that, we can in many ways, you know, relieve what might be a human instinct to, you know, recoil against uh, an argument you might be making or a counter argument against the position I just took and more towards, hey, let's let's look down at the sheet in front of us. Let's comment on, on more of the data and provide analysis of that data. And as a result, that is a brokerage of, of communication that when you're part of it is is truly fascinating. When you've delivered effective scheduling and you've brought in, say, owners and contractors to have those discussions or owners and design teams or design teams amongst the various uh, the disciplines, it, it's a wonderful feeling. It, it's and and I think that's the fulfillment you get from scheduling. That's awesome. And you know, n- another point now that I think about this question that I've just asked you is, um, I think that we need to also remember that uh, in in part of like the stakeholder group. I mean, like we have the you know the actual client or the owner of the project, and you also have your team members. Those are also stakeholders as well. And I think that. Um, scheduling is so important because like you said, there are so many different components to who's actually on your team. You know, like you may have, you know, accountants, the finance team, the HR group within your company is also a small part of your team, but having a schedule in place really helps for everybody to be able to understand where the project actually is. And I think that oftentimes, like a lot of people are kind of left out of conversations here and there. And Therefore, it just leads to a lot of confusion, a lot of you know, double work, triple work, um, or work taking too long, scope creep, hope creep. I think that these are all things that are very important. So scheduling is also one of like the main components in a, in a project in general. I mean, like in one of our uh, leadership, project management, leadership development courses, we actually talk about a three-legged stool of project management. And in that three-legged stool, of course, is going to be the scope, the schedule, and the budget. And with the scope, with the schedule being like the second part, if the schedule is not adequate, then the whole stool falls and loses stability. So I think it's really important that those are like the main three things in a project that every person or every individual within an engineering firm needs to pay attention to. And the other things are kind of like, those are also important, but that's not like the column that actually supports the whole entire project like scheduling actually does. So I think that's an important point to note as well, in addition to your point. So absolutely. And, and yeah. I, I really like that analogy. I think professionally I've, I've relied upon that. I think in, in one of the ways it brings the feature of, of an unnecessary for balance, right? So, exactly. um, so that schedules don't get dominated by, and therefore kind of by that analogy have one stool leg that's far higher than the others and put that stool out of balance. And so I think the the art of scheduling is the acknowledgement of where maybe the schedule becomes a little bit disproportionately concerned in terms of the other aspects and knowledge areas, if you will, that a project manager is attempting to provide. So um, I, I really think you, you nailed it there. Yeah. And another point, I think that we've all been in elementary school and we've all been on one of those stools that has one of those legs that's shorter than the other. And we all know that that's right. is annoying. It's just, it sucks, you know? <laughs> yeah. You yeah. just want to stick a piece of paper under there, a piece of wood or something to get it. <laughs> a couple of sugar <laughs> packets or something. <laughs> <Yes>. Yeah. Something. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, let's move on to the next question here. And let's talk about and discuss the impact of project controls on project leadership decision. Have you seen that play out with, uh, you know, managing engineering projects? Absolutely. I mean, I think the art of um, project controls is it provides dials and measures to really kind of give you one of two uses generally. It's either going to guide decision-making in terms of a lot of folks that I interact with have oftentimes heard me use the phrase to the right of the data date. So for those of of your listeners who are maybe familiar or not as familiar with a a Gantt chart, but you see that that tall vertical line that indicates anything to the left of it is actual and arrears that you can report to, and anything to the right of it is the, the, the calculated forecast. And so the controls, at least for within that scheduling context, can either guide you 
to write up the day-to-day decision-making based on estimates, risks, et cetera, or to the left of the day-to-day where there's consequences of one's decisions or potentially indecisions as it pertains to actual performance relative to past plans, right? And at that point, as of that date, that that's prologue to ultimately where you need to be to the right. So, you know, it really for impacts perspective, does the schedule lead the project or does the project lead the schedule? And, and I've really seen that. Uh, and frankly, my practice really delves into those two arenas. On the one hand, you know, if we're uh, forecasting, uh, we're looking into and using skill sets that are steeped in risk management, probability estimating, but then also uh, controls is, is there for purposes of forensics, what happened, record keeping, uh, and to support disputes and, and to resolve those disputes as well. So I think that's where, you know, there's combination for both in a given project, but the hope is you're doing more of the former to avoid the latter, but the controls have capabilities, if you will, in, in both uses. Okay. I'm going to ask you a follow-up question here just to, so we're already on the topic of project control. So, you know, yeah. how could you answer, how could project controls help in identifying any deviations from the actually planned schedule early on? Like, are, are you able to to forecast if there's going to be any issues to your actual schedule using project controls? Absolutely. Uh, I think, you know, some of your your classic ones are your so-called performance indicators. Uh, your, uh, KPIs, your, yeah. Uh, your indices, C, yeah, C, uh, so you've got cost performance indices and schedule performance indices. And really what you're attempting to evaluate there kind of in that scenario of what is in the past versus what is in the future is in the past, if you've got a means to determine some percentage of work attained to this point relative to how much you've spent. And did you perform more than you plan relative to your spend? Uh, we're getting into some earned value tenants here, but you know, at the end of the day, that gives you a certain percentage that if you're clipping along at greater than 100% of what you plan to date relative to your spend, then arguably you can use that in the denominator of what's remaining on your project to calculate that you actually have some wiggle room in terms of future productivity. Of course, the converse is also true, right? To the extent that you can detect early lacking of production through some non-attainment of some amount of work, um, either measured in cost or in schedule performance relative to what your spend was or your time utilization was, well, then that performance indice- index is less than 100% and put that in the denominator. And now it's going to give you a certain performance that you do need to attain that historically, at least on that project, you haven't been able to. And so using those two performance indices in particular, and just using them in terms of just like I walked you through, just back of the envelope math of establishing you know, where you're at the project and how you've been performing to this point. The reality of it is if, if you've been underperforming to this point and you keep that production the same and or you don't make any other uh, future plans, well, then that control is giving you an indicator of, of potentially late production, or you are, if you take too much time thinking about what your outcome is, you're going to reduce your options as you get closer to the finish of that project. So, so I think to, those are the two big ones. CPI and SPI are measures that we look at a lot to give you assessments of your estimate at completion and your estimate to complete at any given time. And those are, like I said, rudimentary calculations that ranging from highly sophisticated scheduling software to Excel and back of the envelope math to give you uh, some predictive outcomes. Okay, cool. And, you know, that actually brings up another question for me. I'm, I'm curious about how those two uh, key performance indicators were actually found. Like, are you, do you guys usually calculate by hand? Is there a spreadsheet that has been developed? Is there a software that you guys use? And if there is a software, could you just uh, like discuss the specific software that you use that you found that's valuable for scheduling, cost tracking, and also risk management? Sure. So the the formulas are out there. Like I said, CPI and SPI are, are oftentimes structured and there's a variety of different formulas based on which inputs that you have, right? So if you have yeah. earned value, plan value, actual cost, and in a value context, uh, your estimate to complete and estimate at completion based on those performance indices are, are what they are. So uh, short of walking through all the different formulas um, that those are available. And like I said, can be readily done, you know, by hand calculator and an Excel spreadsheet can all provide you that, that measurement. Uh, we will often produce um, S curves 
uh, where we're trying to evaluate percentage of, of performance on the cost basis across the percentage of performance on a schedule basis. And by and large, what that gives you is, is a parameterization, if you will, of, of basically a line that you want to see linearly from 0%, 0% at the beginning to 100%, 100%. That basically you don't want to see too much, uh, if you will, variance between how much time and how much uh, money you're spending. Now, there again, there is a natural um, non-linearity to it based on certain front upfront expenditures that need to be taken for mobilization, things of that nature that need to be accounted for. But it's a good rough guide if you're looking at, let's say, monthly expenditure on a construction project and that construction project has time charges associated to it, for example. You get a real good sense for potential slippages based on the relative slope of that line. So if you start to see your curve start to tail down and kind of project forward, what that slope is. And if it's not necessarily lining up with that zero to 100, uh, 45 degree angle uh, slope, if you will, you're going to, um, uh, that that can be at least some early indicators. And you could do certain projections there in terms of if you do nothing, then that will ultimately cause your project to be X percent beyond 100%. And that's, uh, and that's where you get into some, you know, further analytics. But as it pertains to then software, you know, there's a variety of software tools out there and there's been a metamorphosis of those tools uh, during my career. You know, there are some highly sophisticated ones uh, that to the credit of the software publishers, I think they are doing well to make them, if you will, less imposing. And what I mean by that, for example, is uh, Primavera P3. You know, back in the day, uh, that software tool was really a, a tried and true standard, certainly in the construction and, and CapEx industries. But I think it, it's in its sophistication, in some ways, was challenging for others beyond schedulers and schedule analysts to really meaningfully engage in a schedule. There's a lot of knobs, a lot of visuals, just a lot of things going on. And, and really schedules need not be that complex. Certainly for necessarily complex projects, you're going to want complex tools. Um, yeah. But the um, the Oracle Premier Clouds of the World, for example, we provide a, a much more, if you will, approachable experience to, to scheduling. And in Microsoft Project, I think does does a nice job in terms of being readily accessible, you know. And like I said, at, at some point, you know, Excel and just taking the opportunity to to lay out your dates and if nothing else, generate an implied logic. Um, and if you need a more sophisticated tool to be more explicit about how that logic works to calculate those dates, then you know maybe make the jump to those tools. So yeah, I talked a little bit about those tools for scheduling, yeah. getting into then cost tracking and risk management. That's where I think a lot of modern tools are now starting to become much more of project management suites or toolboxes or ecosystems, so to speak. So mm -hmm. what used to be P3 is primarily a, a scheduling tool and was largely a, a task management tool with some rudimentary cost features now becomes an Oracle Primavera cloud, for example. And I say that because Oracle had since bought Primavera. That's the namesake now yeah. um, and enables you to not only do scheduling within one toolbox, but then also bring your cost controls uh, capabilities or what they call an app and the risk abilities in, in a different app and and have them all tied together in one database. So, you know, I think in a, in a year or two, I'm going to be really curious to see how the industry itself adopts to that newer tool for an integrated concern of, uh, I think you asked scheduling, cost tracking and risk management to name three and the other controls now in one place where you can realistically, you know, integrate and use those data sets as as connected pieces, as opposed to an Excel spreadsheet tracking costs here and a schedule tracking mm -hmm. time there, really creates some interesting opportunities for the future. That excites me as a as a controller. Yeah, it definitely excites me as well because I mean, I was actually just talking to another podcast guest yesterday, uh, Mr. Robert Otani. And we had a bit of a conversation about the nuances of getting artificial intelligence integrated into project management softwares and talking about the nuances because basically there isn't anything that's really developed as of yet because it's such a complex topic. But I think that once that is achieved, that's really going to be revolutionary in where our industry goes. Um, but like you said, you know, like when it comes to the cost tracking and the risk management and the scheduling oftentimes like we've just had so many different programs that we've had to okay i'm going to put this facet of the project in this one and this one here and then this one there and it's like we're just coming together now like the forks in the road yeah. are like all now starting to kind of merge into one i think it's a really beautiful thing i really wonder 
who is going to become the industry leader when it comes to that? Um, and who's going to have like the premier software? And the, do you have any ideas about where that direction is going to go or a theory or prediction about who is going to be the one? Sure. I mean, it's just theories, right? Speculation right. <laughs> from, from one podcast participant. But, you know, I do mention yeah. Oracle Preamber Cloud, you know, and I'm not a salesperson or anything. I'll let Oracle yeah. sell those tools uh, to, to your listeners. But, but uh, you know, I do see a lot of potential in that solution in particular because I'm experienced enough to have had to use previous versions of those tools where technology was the true limitation on the scheduling process or the project management processes where, you know, there were days where schedules were transmittable once upon a time and, you know, floppy disks. And that left very little room for any sort of collaboration or simultaneous oversight of a schedule versus me saving a copy of the schedule and giving it to you to process for however you saw fit. So I see that as as a really exciting development. You know, there are some inherent challenges to accessing those tools. And to that end, there's a lot of responsibility for a project controller and the larger team in terms of data governance to make sure that those tools are giving you in their now integrated state effective reads. And, uh, and that can sometimes be a challenge in terms of you know, utilizing other facets of a tool, you know, there might be a, a company that's, you know, already has a, a cost tool already in place. Well, now then they've got a decision to make in terms of do they do they now kind of tear out that part of, of their operation to, you know, use a, a, a fully featured toolkit, the Oracle Premium Vera Clause of the World provide, you know, that's that's up to the, them. And obviously Microsoft is is playing their hand, relatively speaking, to project. And like I said, that kind of that integrated experience with the other kind of tools that they sell companies, either owners or, or contractors or designers. So, you know, my hope is that ultimately the technology becomes less of a reason why the human processes can't happen, right? So that if you can re remove the boundaries that lacking technology once posed, to aspirations of project managers and project teams to collaborate and solve problems. You know, if you can shed some of those things and, and give people visibility to those things and let them be the creative humans that they are and make value judgments that no AI or computer is necessarily going to replace, I think that's that's where I'm going to be looking. And whether, like I said, the name Oracle Premier Cloud or some of those other Procore and other kind of toolboxes that they bring to to organizations, uh, that would be my world speculation right now. But uh, down the road, I, I hope I would hope for the industry that whoever brings that to bear will enable the industry to uh, solve those problems that historically they may not have been able to. Yeah, I think that um, I need to just go ahead and make a list of all of these companies and buy some stock before they blow up. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that could be my retirement. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, well, uh... there's there's a few of them out there, and there's some upstarts too. You know, I think that's that's yeah. one of the the, the things. Primavera once upon a time was you know a relatively small firm, and you mm -hmm. know they they had their sleeves rolled up. And I speak this speak to this with enthusiasm as a small business participant myself. Is you know that they're you know doing nights and weekends to innovate, and, and I think there's some pretty exciting things that that the the smaller players are are trying to bring to bear, and um, and and that's exciting too. And I think the industry deserves to, uh, you know, take a look at, at what, uh, you know, the, the power projects and the others that maybe are, are bringing out and, uh, and, and take a look at those things. And, and maybe, you know, when you and I have another podcast and however many years we'll be talking about how something that neither of us today know about is, is going to be the industry leader and, uh, we'll see. Okay. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about stakeholder management before, but I want to kind of get back into that um, as we're wrapping up this segment here. So I just want to know, first off, and we didn't cover this yet, but uh, in project controls, can you explain to the audience what project controls actually is? And could you also talk about how project managers can effectively manage stakeholder expectations related to project timelines? I mean, I think that that is a question that kind of needs to be asked because in my experience, oftentimes the stakeholders expectations are not going to match with the actual timeline of the project. And so there's always a disconnect and a nuance there. 
But in your experience, can you sure. explain that a little bit more in detail? Sure. And, and I'll try to unpack that and uh, kind of break that out into parts. I, I think the, the essence of project controls is it's alluded to this earlier. It's, it's really the art and science of the preparation of the project data to drive or indicate where your project has been driven. Uh, that's in the form of planning and scheduling, estimating, risk and issue analysis, and that's data. In, in much the same way by analogy, uh, others have heard me use this as, you know, elaborate dashboards on on cars. Uh, yeah. You know, and if the project manager by the analogy is the driver, you know, an abundance of, of you know, literal dashboard uh, widgets doesn't make that driver necessarily better. And, and you could yeah. argue that a driver can actually get from point A to point B if the dashboard went completely blank. Um, but the reality of it is, would you want to? And conversely, if the abundance of that information is there, would you as the driver make a different decision if, for example, you know, the temperature of your engine is, is you know, a certain place and, you know, would that cause you to keep trucking down the road at 75 as you're leaving a city, you know, things of that nature. So, so I think that by some description using an analogy is, is what project controls is then the skill set involved is, is, you know, associated to data, data analysis, um, making decisions on, you know, the, if you will, the appropriate columns of data that are going to be relevant to the interests of the project manager and ultimately the stakeholders. And, uh, and don't track data for Dana's sake. That might be the example yeah. that I'd use there. Um, so, you know, I like that. So I think the, the part of the, the question then was, you know, how do we, how do we use that? Just refresh my, my memory, Matt, on that second part of the question you were talking about stakeholder expectations. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I just sure I dovetail in to cover that. Yeah, okay. sure. I mean, just wanted to know like how project managers can effectively manage the stakeholders expectations related to the project timeline. So the timeline that you set sure. versus the timeline that they have in their head. No. Right. Right. And, you know, going back to, you know, the previous analogy of, uh, of the stool, what I tend to approach there is that if, if time is of the essence, then scope and budget is what you're discussing with the stakeholders, right? Because you already know what their number one time imperative is and successful project management is not, in my opinion, um, to somehow successfully negotiate someone whose otherwise number one priority is this outcome, but rather to what degree can you as a controller providing data and elements of information to guide, to deliver on that number one priority or a project manager's ability to say, okay, well, if time is of the essence, I need to really think about the costs associated to the resources that I'm going to need to get that project done, whether it be, if you will, a, a design uh, that needs to be accomplished and, and, to what degree do I need to involve senior expertise, uh, additional resources, et cetera? What, what costs do those come? Or are there elements of the scope where, hey, I need this thing done by a certain date? Are there elements that we can make sure that I, as a project manager, are really truly understanding of the scope? Or are there opportunities there to say, you know, maybe we can simplify this or chuck that part out to a future phase, but I, as the as the stakeholder, really need this one thing done? And start asking at least questions to make sure you truly understand the nature of that scope. And is there some refinement there um, that enables you, to, if nothing else, to critique your own assumptions on what you thought the scope was? And if so, then you're not putting yourself into potentially a difficult situation with your client or your stakeholder. And like I said, trying to talk them away from what was well and truly important enough to them to communicate to you to help solve. Well said. I don't know if I have anything else to add on to that. That was pretty, that's pretty good. <laughs> good job there. And lastly, Thanks. I just want to ask about what final piece of advice do you have for any engineers that are aspiring to either get into project management, become better project managers, or even get into project controls? Sure. I think I'll begin with the latter part in terms of project controls and, and the relative enthusiasm that I hope I've imparted in terms of I'm, I get yeah. excited about that. And I've obviously, yeah. you know, planted my flag that that's where I've, I've chosen uh, my technical career path. And, and, and I think that comes with a, an aspiration of project controllers to aspire to set the course, right? Set the direction. That doesn't mean that's done on an island. And in fact, I think project controls can really run aground if the project controller is, you know, 
he or she who's off in the corner generating reports and data, irrespective of how the project team and the project manager is is effectively communicating and and managing issues. So the opportunities for project controllers is readily increasing. Um, and again, in the presence of kind of what we were talking about before, in the presence of newer technologies that maybe industries or entities have not necessarily taken advantage of, uh, you know, as it pertains to project controls and integration to other systems or, you know, BIM models or however, that I think project controllers are, are have, have a bright future. Um, and, and if they're intrinsically motivated to, you know, set the course of direction and, and communicate, I think that they'll be very successful. Uh, I think the last uh, word of advice on, on the project controls aspirations is, is um, and really kind of at my own admission is an area where I find incredible respect and appreciation for others is, is getting that field experience. Uh, I think my career as I kind of let off was, is one built in the design shop and, and was in the field, you know, periodically as needed during design and ultimately got into more construction management type responsibilities. But I see by contrast to others with X number of years of experience, similar to my own, who've got more field experience, the nature of their practical understanding of work in the field and the ability to track progress in a practical sense is a skill set unto itself um, that uh, I think I continue to aspire to that might otherwise be a little bit more on the theoretical side. And so I, I think that that field experience to enable practicality and the data preparation that is incumbent project controls is, is absolutely essential. Uh, now, then building on top of that for the project management uh, aspirations is, you know, have a core understanding of those project controls principles, core understanding of, of planning budgets and baselines, scheduling tasks and tracking uh, accompanying costs estimating and risk and understanding the association between risk management and contingency that either your budget or your timeline must provide and how that all rolls up together in terms of what your contract says, which is basically the floor of expectation to meet your commitments to your clients. And that I think we all live in a world in a professional services business, at least that the contract is, like I said, the floor of that expectation. And as a PM and as a good PM, you're obviously looking to stay off of that floor. And the way that that right. can be done is a deep understanding of those controls principles. So you know where your commitments are and you're nowhere near just providing those minimal service, but you're wowing your clients and generating that that wheel of valuable service to them and, and earning that opportunity to do that, that future work. So, so yeah, controls, foundational pieces in the field, project managers, uh, understanding of those principles. Uh, you know, you don't need to know the differences between a contemporaneous time impact analysis and some other as-built analysis that a scheduler might, but be aware of how time impact analyses are relevant to solving problems in the future, or at least identifying responsibilities in the contract in your past. No, that was good. And, you know, to your point, I definitely agree about the field work, field, being a field engineer, or be, at least being like on the front lines of seeing what is actually happening with your project. I think it's absolutely critical to understanding what project controls and, and getting a better understanding of project management, because how can you understand if you don't actually know what goes into it? I think that sometimes a lot of professionals may just like skip around a lot and they may just miss a lot of important steps, which leads to a lot of struggling along their career and a lot of being thrown into the fire, at least that's what we think it is, but it's like we threw ourselves into the fire willingly because we didn't put in the the work necessary on the ground level to take the time and learn over time, like from a, a very elementary level and just kind of being spood fed uh, with it at first. And then eventually, you know, being promoted to an engineer two and then an engineer three. And then now you're a project manager, you know, like now you're doing uh, project control. So it's like we, we sometimes just bite off more than we can chew because we're getting into something, trying to manage something without actually knowing what goes into it in the first place. You don't even have the essentials. You know, you don't know, like, know sure. all of the elements that go into it. So I think that it's a really important point that you stated there. And also your point as well about uh, just being into project management and just knowing the different components of, of project management and managing the scope, the schedule and the budget and making sure that your communication is intact and talking to your stakeholders and doing your resource planning and your project management plans, all of those different things I think are very important. So I think that you 
I don't know. You've just been hitting the nail on the head constantly this whole entire time. So I haven't really had yes. much to say or add because you've already said, you know, most of it. Yeah. It's a good conversation. Yeah. Good. All right. So we're going to take a short break here. And when we get back, we're going to talk to Michael about what he sees as the biggest PM pitfalls in the industry. Stay tuned. All right, everybody. Thanks for coming back. And it's now time for our PM Pitfall segment of the week with Michael Watry. Michael, you ready? Yes, sir. All right, cool. So, Mike, we just want to ask you, what are some of the biggest PM pitfalls that you've identified in the industry and how would you recommend overcoming it or avoiding it for any of the PMs that are looking at this podcast right now? What advice can you give them to avoid those pitfalls? Sure. That's a good question. I, I think what comes to mind is the blessing that I've been given in terms of the opportunities to diversify my skills over the years based on mentors who took the time to understand the skill sets that I acquired through academia and past experience to natural skill sets to really identify and help guide me into uh, positions of uh increasing responsibility and ultimately down a, a project management and project controls career. Um, and I say that I, I think as an initial instinct to set the table to answer the question is that I think that they understood that there was a relatively thin, if you will, football in the Venn shaped diagram between project management, project controls and engineering right? The roles and responsibilities, if you will, of a traditional engineer may or may not necessarily line up within the, the, the union between project management and engineering. Uh, the skill sets, there are different skill sets required for engineering versus controls, and there's, there's, uh, there's overlapping ones as well. And all of that is to say then that maybe the biggest pitfall is that a project manager uh, is not a, a, a relatively senior engineer by a different title. Um, that is that there are technical requirements of the roles and responsibilities of being an engineer that are simply not met with the skill sets of a project manager and vice versa. Um, and therefore, you know, uh, a person who may have been, you know, Matt, as you were saying, maybe thrust into a certain career ascendancy and suddenly they had the project manager title dropped on them, whether they wanted that or not, you know, may not be prepared to you know, see the forest from the trees of an overall project versus having the technical understanding and acumen to dive into one particular challenge. Um, Absolutely. And, and, or might just rely on kind of how, uh, you know, to have a, a technical career requires work and effort and just grit and work and effort and grit is something the art of project management is to elicit from a team and not necessarily just cause unto yourself. Um, and, and leadership uh, is, is, in my opinion, in coming upon identifying those opportunities and giving those to others. So, so I think that to avoid those pitfalls is to overcome that urge to be everything to everyone. Um, and that my project management experience is steeped on that enablement. Um, and, and part of that comes with a, a critical evaluation of maybe I can, but should I? Or I know I can, but I know I can't. And so as a PM, you're trying to bring that expertise. And, and as a, as someone who's maybe grappling with career growth, you know, that could be an opportunity to really dissect what is it that, that you're wanting to do. There is tons of room right now for technically savvy senior expertise who are familiar with how things get built, how things get designed, et cetera. And there's also incredible growth opportunity for project management, but just because there's opportunities for both doesn't mean that it's the same opportunity for each one and and therefore be cognizant of that. And I, you know, it's interesting that the analogy just kind of popped in my head is, is having played Little League, you know, once upon a time, pretty decent baseball player. And what I would say is, you know, back in Little League, the pitchers were also the great hitters. Um, but you look at the major leagues, the pitchers really don't much ever bet at all. I mean, probably maybe it's the exception, but but by and large, just that's the, you know, the element of baseball is that the pitchers don't hit. 
But I would bet that most of them were the greatest hitters in Little League. And I think what that reflects is the opportunity uh, that they saw and said, what do I want to be good at? Because I could be good at a lot of things and I'm going to choose to pitch and therefore not dedicate as many of the 24 hours in a given day to practicing hitting. And as a result, those outcomes are what they are. And so uh, anyway, my hope is for for those of y'all on uh, listening on this podcast is is to on a rolling basis, evaluate what that, uh, what it is that, that you're aspiring to, um, and be willing to, um, not necessarily say goodbye to this, the, the aspiration of being technically proficient, but sees that as an opportunity to say, I don't, I don't have that, but I now have the opportunity to provide that to others. And there is incredible fulfillment in that as a project manager. In, in that it doesn't feel like a concession, even if at first, you know, I really, for example, really wanted to get into highly detailed structural analyses. I never got that chance, but that was a conscious decision that I made when I had trusted uh, mentors guiding me through the other facets of a project. So here we are now and, and, and hope I can provide that to others. Wow. That, I think that's, uh, you said a lot there, but I, I, what I really summarize from that is the point in doing the inner work, like you have to identify like what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are and what you actually want to take on, which direction you want your, your career to go into. And I think that oftentimes, especially in this economy, that a lot of us thrust ourselves into different roles in order to have an opportunity either to provide for ourselves or for our family. And with that, you can actually take on a lot of baggage, a lot of bad things can happen as a result of that because you may not be truly effective in your new role because you're taking something on that doesn't truly align to your strength. So um, I really agree with your point there. But now as we're closing out, and thank you for that point because it was great. I just want to ask if you can provide if you know any books that you like or that you that you read that you think will help an aspiring project manager grow to the level that you are at and your level of expertise and also where people can find you um, if you are on social media or if you're on LinkedIn, people can connect with you professionally. Sure. Uh, I'll take that in reverse with, the, uh, uh, I think, a little bit of a caveat uh, or a hedge on, on your question about books. But uh, uh, certainly uh, check me out on, on LinkedIn. Uh, MTWPE is, is the handle. I hope to hear from you. I want to connect with you. want to be an active participant in, in this industry and, and to if this is an opportunity for you to, to get to know me and, and, and quite frankly, the, the team of people that, that um, have enabled me to uh, become who I've been able to become within the firm and, and the clients that I provide services to. You know, as to the question on books, I think that's a gotcha. I, I really, I think I struggled a little bit there um, in the sense that I'm not as, I don't do as much reading as maybe an industry expert should towards this, that, or the other kind of components. I look at, you know, the PMI, uh, PMBOK as, as a go-to source, but that's not something that I'm necessarily reading at, at nine o'clock at night, uh, I admit. So yeah. I think, uh, in absence of any particular titles, I, I think what I maybe would classify myself and some therefore, uh, on, as your listeners might also classify themselves as, is an activity learner, you know, uh, that is to say, and, and you've, you've heard me as, as, as a theme that I'm a product of the decisions that I've made based on the opportunities that I've been afforded by people who cared and were genuinely concerned about uh, a mutual interest that I had and that were needed in, in projects and subsequently industry. And so the ability to um, roll up my sleeves and be part of projects and to participate in conversations, including this one. Um, and to learn from those conversations, listen to your other podcasts. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, what I you know find is, is kind of gives me that reverence where I don't necessarily read about it, but I experience it and then I contemplate it and hopefully use that to guide my actions towards uh, providing for others. So may not have been the question you necessarily asked me directly on, on book titles. I wish I, I had that better prepared for you. Uh, the types of books no. that I read are things like Malcolm Gladwell and fiction and those kinds of things. But, uh, and hey, so my you gotta kids, have a but, release uh, somewhere, you know? <laughs> yeah. Right. But, uh, <laughs> but I think it's a good question. And those who have, uh, yeah. I, you know, I, I think what I would, would maybe clarify as a caveat there is, 
Um, you know, I think that there are organizations who do a lot of publications with uh, either, you know, with bite size um, offerings of information um, and okay. dedicated to the cause, right? PMI, chiefly among them, uh, been a member for years with AACE International. Um, and that's really a, a, a provider of, of uh, really interesting materials for project controls expertise. And, and that's where I really cleave to that, that group and that organization too. So anyway, uh, hope that, uh, hope I can answer maybe the question you didn't ask, but uh, well, uh, still give your, give your listeners something to, to go for from. No, that, uh, that definitely makes me feel a little bit better because I'm also kind of the same way. Um, I have books. I have not read them yet. I have a, a right. ton of eBooks as well. Still have not read those yet. Yeah. Um, you know, sure. life is busy. And again, this kind of plays into what we were just talking about with the whole, uh, you know, going along with your strengths. And sometimes time is just not uh, really as much of an asset for some people as it is for others because we have other things that we are doing. So it's just about ingesting the material the way that is best suited for you. So for me, it's audiobooks. Uh, for me, it's also YouTube University. Um, so, yeah. and, and I'm very proud to say that because, <laughs> you know, instead of me spending the time to like actually read something, I am watching it on 1.5 X speed or two X speed. And I'm learning it sure. two times as fast, you know, you just have to do what you have to do. But, um, I thought that was just a funny point there. Um, oftentimes you don't see a lot of people that are like us that, you know, like we're reading for pleasure, you know, and not necessarily sure. just like reading up, you know, uh, the, the pin box next manual or something or reading another publication or so. I mean, here and there it's okay, but short form content, uh, like I just mentioned really works out for me. And I'm pretty sure that it works in alliance with other people's strengths as well. Um, and, and I think yeah. your, your, your community, uh, is evidence of that. I think that the mm -hmm. medium that y'all have chosen for these podcasts to invite you know, folks like myself to, uh, make meaningful contributions. And, uh, I think, you know, if people weren't interested, you wouldn't have the subscriber base that you have. And so, you know, right. it's a congratulations to you that I think you all just inherently having Thank this you. structure, um, provide that. And, and I think frankly, that there are expectations of, of participants in our industry now who, who, you know, like you said, the YouTube university, I don't think there's a thing I've done on <laughs> my car that I hadn't done without watching that or whatever. Oh, so, man. um, I think we're going to see more of what you do and more of what mm -hmm. your team does. Um, and, and if that can broaden, you know, raise the tide of, of boats of folks in, in this industry, I think, uh, you're part of that solution. So congrats to you. All right. Well, thank you on that. And one more point I want to mention, if anybody's looking for any type of way to fix their car, Scotty Kilmer is your guy on YouTube. I love this guy. He, he's great. Just wanted to shamelessly plug that in there. <laughs> there you but, go. Um, anyways, we thank you, Michael, for coming on to the podcast today. Um, and yeah, thank you for all of the wisdom and knowledge that you've given us. And we will see you next time. Thank you, sir. Please remember that you can find the show notes for this episode at www.engineeringpmpodcast.com. And there you'll find the summary of everything that we discussed today, including resources, websites, and books, and everything that we mentioned in today's episode. Until next time, I wish you all the very, very best in all of your engineering project management endeavors. Take care.